Come on, celebrate Jesus. Yeah. 
right into this place of worship. God wants to speak to somebody. He's trying to draw somebody close to him. When we draw nigh unto God, he will draw nigh unto us. He has given us the opportunity to come to him and call him Abba Father. And this morning, he wants to remind somebody that here you are right now, and he's drawing you in. Keep the 
RHC family, today I want to encourage you to tithe today. Something that I have seen the Lord work in me is definitely through tithing. In January, I lost my job and I didn't have a job for about two months. And in that time, I only received one paycheck. And with that paycheck, I still felt led in my heart to give that 10%. And it's really funny, actually, because you think, like, every penny counts, every penny matters. But I just know, I hear stories, testimonies, and we just know the God that we serve, that when we give to Him, it will be given back 
left us. And so that is something I definitely saw. That even though I got one paycheck and still tied it, the Lord, you know, supplied so much joy. There was not one day that I went without joy. Um, and then even I truly believe because I gave that the Lord set me up with an even better job. And so I am now walking in that blessing of giving. And so today I just want to encourage you to give that 10%. Kiddos, son is heading down. <laughs> These are all the ways you can give. Cash app, dollar sign, dollar sign, text, go online. What you see is what you can do, how you can do it. So my, uh, my peoples, they rolled out on me because they didn't want to go to hell. It's okay. Let so once I get done praying, I'm actually going to do the bags by myself. It's okay. It's okay. My job is done. Circuit. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for your love. Thank you for your mercy, God. Thank you for always being there on time. Even when we can't see it, you are always, always on time. We love you. Please bless every penny, every dollar, every check, every text, every cash in the that's coming in for your kingdom and for your glory. None of us. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. 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 Sister Shay, would you help me? I'm going to wait on your dad. Worship team, we love and appreciate you. Come on, guys, let our worship team know. I know a couple of them are out, but we got a couple of dollars. up one and two for me. <laughs> so good to be in the house of the Lord this morning. Are you glad to be here today? So apparently none of y'all seen the text. I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. Amen. 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 But real quick, um, before I get started, I'm going to be in Luke chapter five. If you want to uh, turn your scriptures that way, I'm going to be Luke five and we'll read from the ESV on that. This is what you come help me out real quick. I'm going to make you do nothing too crazy. Just come right here for me. Can everybody give my beautiful wife a round of applause this morning? She's going to my butt. She's got a messy bun going on. So I'm she'll hold this right quick. No, but for I just needed her to hold that real quick because a revival is in, I think the countdown said 12. Put that countdown timer back up real quick, KK. 12 days, some odd hours. We're into hours with the 12 days. Now, Henry, we got minutes and seconds going over here, okay? This is the official revival t-shirt that we got going on. Of course, you guys know our mission statement comes out of Matthew 28 and 19. So we hooked up with Tri-Effect and with their shirts. And we threw the great commandment inside of the goals because it's our goals to carry out the great commission, right? And then on the back, we got our full mission statement, right? Embrace, engage, equip, and highlighted letters for some of y'all with short attention spans that don't want to do the whole thing, right? Here, hold this real quick. <laughs> and then, for you people with longer attention span, or for you readers, as uh, somebody called me the, the other day, I was trying to help him out and some he was trying to explain something to me and I pulled the description out and read it to him and and I don't think that's what happens here. I think this is what's supposed to happen. And he was like, Well you're a reader. And I said, Yeah, those little instructions are in there for a reason. So you know what's happening. But whatever. Anyway, Angie's going to be outside after church today, uh, uh, right outside the doors here. She's got these shirts for uh, sale. You can do our cash app. Uh, you can do risenhopechurch.com. Text to give, of course, just regular cash. The shirts are $15 each. We want to get them sold. We want to show up and show out at Revival. We're going to have a lot of people here, so we want to be uh, decked out during our time of Revival. Amen? Amen. Amen. So make sure to see Miss Angie. And can we give it up for our guest today in the house? If you're a guest with us today, we thank you for being here. You could have been anywhere to worship, but you chose to be with us today, and we greatly appreciate that. See, Henry, we're at 12 days, 6 hours, 10 minutes, and 42 seconds. 
It was 13 yesterday. But look, if anybody asks about Tent Revival, you can send them to our webpage and, and KK can scroll up. There's several things on there for them. There's flyer on there, shirts on there, different things of that nature, some different stuff coming. We'll have an itinerary on the webpage because I thought we could hand out papers or we could just put the itinerary for the weekend on there. So, man, this is going to be hot, as Henry said already. We're going to have... Uh, Todd Hoskins, Joel Burton, Devotion and Motion is going to be here. It's going to be an yeah. amazing weekend. Mobile baptismal trailer showing up on Monday night, and I'm ready to dunk some people. Amen? <laughs> Come on, somebody. Give a praise in this house. <laughs> you can put back on the countdown. Leave the countdown, okay? For those of you that don't know, we got 12 days, 6 hours, 9 minutes, and about 47 seconds, and you can check that out online for all of our online viewers who are joining us today. I was going to go a different direction over the next couple weeks, but, you know, we were in Bible study, as a matter of fact, on Wednesday night, and a conversation came up, and it began to just open my mind uh, to kind of a different subject and a path that maybe we've been down before, but I'm thinking about the revival coming up. I'm thinking about the community here. I'm thinking about the individuals who are a part of uh, the community and what all will happen over the next couple of weeks. And so I'm drawn to Luke 5 and verse 1. The Bible says this, on one occasion while the crowd was pressing in on him to hear the word of God, he was standing uh, by the lake of Gennesaret and he saw two boats by the lake, but the fishermen had gone out of them and were washing their nets. So here's the scene. Here's Jesus. He's been preaching and the crowd is now pressing in around Jesus and Basically, they want Jesus to keep preaching. They want Jesus to keep being Jesus, right? And so they're overwhelming Jesus, and Jesus comes. These disciples that are not quite yet disciples um, are, are out of their boat. They're washing, and Jesus sees this opportunity to step into one of the boats. Uh, verse 3, getting into one of the boats, which was Simon's, he asked him to put out a little from the land. And he sat down and taught the people from the boat. And when he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, put out into the deep and let down your nets for a catch. And Simon answered, Master, we have toiled all night and took nothing. But at your word, I will let down the net. I need you to understand here that this conversation with Jesus, this uh, uh, response from Peter wasn't. Uh, uh, and lordship. This response was sarcasm, right? He's coming back at Jesus because of the stuff that he has faced overnight. Him and his people. Him and his crew around him. Let me read it again for you so you get kind of the catch of the irritation in his voice. It'd be like somebody who works underneath of you or like a child uh, or your niece or your nephew or your daughter or your son or somebody. They're going to have a snapback reply, right? When you ask, can you clean this room up? Can you get the dishes done? Because we need to start cooking dinner, right? And, you know, you catch that real quick until you give them the eye and they realize who they talk to. And then, oh, they got to really back to, Oh, sorry. Oh, crap. But here he is. He says, Jesus is looking at Simon Peter in the boat. They, they, they've been cleaning their nets. And he says, put down into the deep and let out your nets for a catch. You know, Jesus talks. And Simon comes back and he's like, master, we toiled all night and took nothing. You know, he's probably even looking around the boat a little bit. You catch something, bro? I didn't see nothing in this whole boat. You know what I mean, master? It's been a long night in case you ain't noticed. Hey, somebody else? Want... Oh, your boat's empty too. You know what I mean? So this wasn't like, oh, Jesus, thank you for being in my life. This was, master, we toiled all night and took nothing, right? But watch the words that he says next. He's like, I, I don't know if it was really all that, Pastor Mike. He says, but this is Simon still speaking. He says, but at your word, I will let down the net. So in other words, kind of like at your command, you're a carpenter, you're, you're a teacher, you're a rabbi, I'm a fisherman. I've done this. I've been here before Jesus. I know this neighborhood. I know these people. I know my family. I've been preaching to them. I've been letting them know they're going to go to hell, right? I've been doing this and I've been doing that. You don't know who I'm around and what I face, Jesus, but nevertheless, at your word, I'm going to go back and tell them one more time. Come on. And when they had done this, they enclosed a large number of fish, and their nets were breaking. They signaled to their partners in the other boat to come and help them, and they filled both boats so that 
so that they begin to sink. But when Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees. Watch the uh, uh, switch in his uh, disposition. Watch how his character changes now. You know, he gave the clap back, and Jesus went ahead and gave the clap and allowed this load of fish to come on. And now Peter is humbled by the Lord, right? Now the Bible says that Peter, when he saw what is happening, he fell down at Jesus' feet saying, depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. And, and some people, that's a weird statement. I really is this guy begging. He is beginning to understand that what is happening here is what God talks about in the book of Proverbs or what God speaks of in the book of Psalms when he's, he's bringing wisdom in our life or songs of praise unto God. And it says the, or the fear of the Lord is beginning of all wisdom. This doesn't mean that we walk around scared that God is going to zap us down for every little mistake that we make because if he did, a lot of y'all would have be French toast before you got up in church today. Right, right. Okay. okay. At least y'all honest today. Amen. <laughs> right? He's not looking to do that at all. And and but but the fear is is the fear it is the knowledge. You begin to work in this wisdom because it says fear of the Lord is beginning of all wisdom. It's because when this happens, and this is what has just happened with Peter in this moment, the fear of the Lord began to fall on him, and the wisdom of who is in front of him just shifted his whole atmosphere. And Peter in this moment now realized that I just got sideways with Jesus Christ. I just sinned against Jesus, who's bringing in this fall. And now I know who I so I'm like, whoa, depart, for I am I am sinful. I got some issues. I got some problems. I wasn't planning on you getting in my boat today. Jesus ever show up in anybody's house like that? Up in your conversation, your pity party, your Facebook post, you're about to snap back on somebody else. Oh, you know. And then all of a sudden, Jesus is there doing something. You're like, oh, Jesus. <laughs> right? Come on, somebody. For he and all who were with him were astonished at the catch. That they had taken in. And also was James and John and the sons of Zebedee who were partners with Simon. And Jesus said to Simon, do not be afraid. From now on, you will be catching men. And just like that, God put uh, another translation says it like this. It says, do not be afraid. From now on, you will be fishers of men. And I like that translation because because when this happens, Simon is a uh, a fisherman that comes together, but Jesus sees him and Jesus realigns him. He tells him to not be afraid. From now on, he won't be a fisherman, but a fisher of men. And when they had brought their boats to land, they left everything and they followed Jesus Christ. Lord, we praise you today. God, we give you honor. We give you glory in this house for that you have already met with us. You've already been in this house. You've You've already spoke to us today, Lord, and we thank you for that, God. That is more than we deserve on any day. But your word says that you continuously seek to speak to us. You break down barriers. You break down walls. You rip chains apart. Lord, you go above and beyond, God, to get to us through the salvation of Jesus Christ with the power of the Holy Spirit that resides in your believers, Lord. So we thank you today that you are here, that your presence is in this house, that your presence is overwhelming us, Lord. God, and that God, we are going to preach your word. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. So when Jesus shows up, this scene is an interesting scene. I think Jesus shows up in a place that represented a night of struggle. This is a place that uh, represented toil and turmoil and pain and frustration. After all, it was the fishermen's job to catch fish. Like this was the thing that they were good at. You know what I'm saying? It's always something when I see a new uh, wide receiver signed to our football team, right? And when I say our football team, I really mean the Pittsburgh Steelers, in which I get no rewards or, or royalties from, right? So, but 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 we sign these big name receivers sometimes. And, and if you're a football fan at all, you'll know that last year we were plagued with some serious problems. I think that the other teams played our wide receivers to drop balls because there's no way that Big Ben can consistently all season long hit you directly between the numbers and you drop 
the ball, right? And when I think about this frustration, that's the frustration I feel. Because when I see our team dropping the game-winning ball and the touchdown, when we go 11-0 and and then drop out and know we're going to be one and done in the playoffs because we can't even wipe out a bottom-class team anymore, right? Come on, right? That's the thing that I mean to see this frustration that's following in. You guys know what it is. Maybe football's not your thing. But it's really frustrating when you, you're like, yeah, we're going to win a championship. And then at the 11th game, they all start dropping balls magically right we've been here we've done this we're toiling right we're in this place where frustration begins to pull in on them and these disciples are showing their frustration because what they do they have separated themselves from right you know a big name football player listen AB's got his deal AB's got his own thing going on and if you know who Antonio Brown is you know that he is a character and he is a person Personality, right? He is all over the place. And I see that even with Antonio Brown, where he was a he was out there catching all these balls and making all this happen. And then frustration began to show up because he's doing his job week after week and something begins to change. Something begins to shift and he's no longer satisfied. He's no longer seeking that unity within the team. Frustration is setting in as he's toiling and he's laboring and he's disconnecting. The same thing is happening with the disciples here who are going to be called the disciples here in just a few. As they come into that shoreline and they're in this place of labor and frustration. A place that was used as a, a vessel to etch out a meager living now comes a place a reminder that what they did last night, that their efforts and everything that they put in is now a shortcoming. Now falls short. Doesn't quite get to the finish line. Doesn't pay all the bills. Am I preaching to anybody? You put your heart and your soul into your life, into your relationship, into overcoming drug addictions or whatever the thing may be. And you get to this place and sometimes you show up and you get to that low tide and you get in that shallow form of the water and you look back over where God has called you to be and somehow, somewhere you look over the ocean and the waves or whatever God's called you to be over and you think to yourself, why am I in this shallow water? Yeah. Come on. Yeah. Why am I here where the waves are beating me instead of riding me to where I ought to be? Come on. When I think about somebody sailing, I think about somebody that's on the ocean front with that big sail going. You know, I just kind of like, I have these little things, these little things sometimes. I got, I got a very creative imagination, you know what I mean? So even as I start to draw, I wish I could just put it on the screen. You know, just picture your pastor on this big sailboat, 12 foot sail in the air, 14 foot long sail. You know, my long hair, because I'd have long flowing hair if I was doing this right. Come on, wow, yeah, it's going down. It's going down to you, right? Come on, you know what I'm talking about. That's what you want to do, your shirts off, you know. You work out like you've been working out every day for a year. No, you ain't done nothing but get off the couch, right, to get the remote. And you was mad about that. Come on, somebody. That's what I see when I'm sailing. But if we're going to be honest about it, there's a lot of times we got to deal with the shallow waters. There's a lot of times when our efforts have been invested in trying to look like that model on a sailboat or go out there and catch all these fish, which they were actually doing. They weren't just trying to look good. These guys were actually trying to work. And now they're in the shallow place and they're tired, frustrated, discouraged, defeated. They finished all night long and they've accomplished nothing. They've done everything in their power to be successful and somewhere, somehow, they failed. They came up short. Come on, does that ever sound like life to you? Do you ever get frustrated? Do you ever get irritated? Do you ever feel like you're just tired and you have no strength to move on for another day because you're in these shallow waters and it seems like everything keeps spinning out of control? Somewhere along the line, not only personally, but I think the big church has got into that same thing. I mean, here we are week after week. We sing, we pray, we preach, we testify, we shout, we go home, we come here for the next appointed time. And all across the country, people are doing the same thing, whether it's Sunday morning worship or Wednesday night Bible study at 630 or whether they're coming for prayer on the grounds on Saturdays. And, and, and the church starts to feel overwhelmed because where we want to be is where we're not going. I want to read you some stats from pre-COVID real quick. 80% of pastors believe that ministry will negatively 
affect their family. 33% state being in ministry is a hazard to their health. 70% say that they have a lower self-image now than when they first started. 40% uh, report serious conflict with a lay member once a month. 50% have considered leaving the ministry in the last months. 50% of the ministers will not even last five years because of the pressures. 66% of all church members except a minister Excuse me. 60 per, 66% of church members expect a minister and a family to live at higher moral standards than them. Over 4,000 churches are closed each year. Over 1,700 pastors left the ministry every month pre-COVID. Over 1,300 pastors were terminated by their local church each month, many without cause. And many denominations are reporting in their churches what they call an empty pulpit crisis. They cannot find ministers who are willing to fill the positions. Watch what they're saying about the church fatigue and the church shallowness now that we are post-COVID. They're saying that one in five churches are affected negatively by COVID and therefore having to close their doors. Come on, somebody. The church overall has allowed ourselves with the big picture in the church of America to become exhausted. We've allowed ourselves to go out of the deep waters and into the shallow waters where the debris of life is consistently beating us. We've got stuck in the turmoil and the toil and all that stuff that flows in the wood and the driftwood and tires and bottles and everything else. And the thing is, is when you're in the midst of that, trying to clean out your net, your net is continuously getting ripped and torn and re dirty. As you're, anybody else just have your life, you're like, dang it, I'm trying to get things together here. I'm cleaning my net. I ain't even made it a third of the way across, and the thing is already filthy. The thing is already caught up with something. The thing's already got more junk in it, more debris. Who Am I preaching to somebody? <laughs> but watch this. This is the miracle that I see happening here. And this is the miracle that I need us to understand. Because things shift when Jesus Christ shows up into the situation. Sometimes we've been in a season. These disciples, I think they got it easy because they had just over a night deal. Some of us, you maybe have been dealing with something for a year, two years, three years, four years. This may seem like something that is never going to come in, but I tell you today that there's a shift when we allow Jesus Christ to step into the middle of our presence because that vessel that became a place of turmoil and became a place of isolation and become a place of failure will turn into a place of intimacy when we allow Jesus Christ to step into our boats. Come on, somebody. When we allow Jesus to step in, everything has to obey Jesus and shift instantly. Come on. Jesus stepped into that. The Bible says when we draw nigh unto God, he'll draw nigh unto us. The Bible also reminds me throughout the narrative of scripture that God's arm is ever reaching. That means that God will reach down for me no matter where I dig, what hole I get into, what cave I find myself in, what hollow I go down, God will over to. God's arm is ever reaching, therefore never stopping. It will always be reaching out for me. Come on, somebody. And then we just pick up what Jesus is trying to do and we reach out and allow him to come into our boats. What was turmoil? Come on, somebody. What was pain? What was hurt? What was trial? Becomes intimacy. Becomes triumph. Becomes a place of testimony. And I wish somebody would give God praise. Until Jesus walked up, this boat was a place of abandonment. But Jesus took was, was abandoned and made it a place of awesomeness. Put amazing in it. The boat begins to bob. It begins to move. As Jesus walks in, those who are standing close to Jesus begin to see that Jesus is moving through this shift. He's not worried about keeping his legs dry. He's not worried about the muddy beach sand. He's going right into the dirt. Come on, somebody. You need to understand that in order for Jesus to get in this boat, he had to go through some things to get to that boat. Come on. And don't you dare think for one minute that Jesus Christ won't go through some things to get to you. Because my Bible said that the Lord will never leave nor forsake us. My Bible also said, for God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten son, that whoever would believe in him shall not perish, but will have eternal life. My Bible also said that all who call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. My Bible also said, where the Spirit of the Lord is, is the Spirit of prophecy. And I'm prophesying over to you that Jesus will go through. Jesus did. 
come through. As a matter of fact, who stood on that cross 2,000 years ago, saw your junk where it's at, got a hold of it, and took it back. Somebody get praise in this house. This is exactly what they needed in the book. And this is exactly what the church needs today. And this is what the church ought to be. Come on, somebody. This building is nothing more than brick and mortar structure situated beside the road until God's people enter. You need to understand something. But when this building is occupied by those who know the Lord, the structure becomes a place of closeness, a place of intimacy. What I'm telling you is that at, at, at 10.59 this morning, this was nothing but at 11 a.m. when we begin to lift up our right. voice, when we right. begin to lift up our cry, when we begin to seek heaven, chains begin to break, bondage begin to fall, hell begin to take notice. Satan got real worried because God's anointing was in the house. Amen. And this place that was brick and mortar before you showed up with fabric seats and carpet and fancy place became a place of anointing. It is a special place because of who shows up here. The Bible says the Redeemer is here in Matthew 18 and 20. And the Bible tells me in 1 John 3, 1, 2, 1 through 2, that the redeemed of the Lord are here as well. Amen. Amen. Y'all didn't hear me. I said the redeemed of the Lord is here. Yeah. Amen. It is special because of what we do here. The sovereign God is praised and the son of God is preached. The lost can be evangelized. Devils are put into fears. Chains are broken and sons and daughters are brought into adoption. Grafted into the fine with Jesus Christ. Brought into sonship. Our daughtership taken from a place of being lost and separated, broken, isolated, or whatever it is. And all of a sudden, adoption comes into our place and adoption comes into our home. And the Bible says that he grafts us onto the vine, which is a right. very, right. very interesting process. Right. If you don't have a green thumb, I don't have one either. But what I'm saying to you is they cut one plant from its place and they take it over to the vine and they make another cut in it. And then they put that plant down in it. And then they grow together, they sing together, so that we become one yeah. under one baptism, yeah. under one Christ. Come on, yeah. somebody. Under one spirit. I wish y'all would preach with me in this house today. Come on. And Jesus will take care of a situation. He'll turn a, a meager boat into a humble pulpit. I'm going to tell us as a church to never miss the great opportunities of life. Amen. Several years ago, we had an outreach this over my mind. It was in 2012, as a matter of fact. We had this huge outreach. 750 people came through in three hours. With 150 people standing there for the to get in. Some of you were there with us. And in that first big outreach that we did, there was a young lady who had given her life to Christ. And she was serving at that outreach. And she was passing out. Snack-sized, personalized, individual-sized chips. And coming through, we were in Central Park. And coming through that park was her former drug dealer before salvation. And do you know that he asked her what she was doing there at that outreach? And do you know that she just had some boldness, Carrie and Susie? Come on. Like we talked about on Thursday night. They had some, she had some boldness. She allowed the anointing of the Lord to come over her. What she did was she turned that vessel of her life. Here's her dope dealer standing before her. This guy knows what she's been through, right? This guy knows some deep down dirty secrets about her probably, right? And he comes on and he sees her in her turmoil. But Jesus stepped in and gave her a place of intimacy Amen. and has now taken this, this vessel which was once filled with drugs and has turned it into a place where the word of God can reside and be pulled forth and she turned that meager boat or rather that meager vessel of herself into a pulpit and she said I'm here because I got saved by Jesus Christ I know him as my personal Lord and Savior yeah. it's not even the good part she testified to him and he got saved right there amen come on somebody get prayer Never miss great opportunities because they do not look like what you think they should. Come on. My Bible says in the early parts of Acts that they went around breaking bread. My Bible says that in Acts chapter 
three when they came in on that gate called Beautiful. There was somebody laying on their way, and he said, hey, I'm not going to give you no money, but what I do got, you going to rise up and walk today. Jesus went beside that woman on the well there and spoke to her. Jesus took opportunities to stop an entire crowd on the way to heal a, a, a little girl in order to stop and touch somebody who had touched him through a lot. Even his disciples said, Jesus, you're crazy. You'll never figure out who's done it in the middle of this crowd for there are too many people. And Jesus said, well, he didn't say it. I'm going I'm to I'm I'm re-say it how he said it. Basically, Jesus said it like this. He said, somebody's touched me and power's gone out of me. Jesus, I, I just want to hear this in some real translation. These disciples are around him and they're busting in and they're like, hey, no, Jesus, you're not going to find the one. You're not going to find the one. And Jesus is here. He says, nothing happens until I fulfill the purpose in which I have come to do, which is to redeem mankind unto myself. And somebody touched me, so somebody gets an appointment with me. Come on, somebody. All we got to do is reach out and call on Jesus. All we got to do is reach out and begin to pray, begin to push, crawl through some things, and we can get to the very feet of Jesus. No matter where you have been, no matter what your vessel looks like, no matter what you've been tattered from or scarred from or bruised from, Jesus can turn your meager boat into a pulpit. I don't want you to do it. Christ did it a little different for him. He didn't have to have a synagogue, fancy, uh, fancy candles, but rather he stepped into the middle of a stinky fisherman's boat to preach. Paul wrote it to Timothy like this in 2 Timothy verse 4. He said, preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, and exhort with complete patience and teaching. For a time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching, but having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves. Teachers to suit their own passions and will turn away from listening to the truth and wander off in the myths. And sadly for many churches, a church has ceased to be a place where the sins are edified and non-believers are welcomed home, but rather a place where services are under. But here's what happens when Jesus begins to move in our life, and here's what happens when we allow Jesus to move in our life. The journey was certainly a cause for concern, and I bet that many of us have had a journey that's been a cause for concern up to this point. We've taken matters into our own hand. We've fished, we've toiled, we've labored, and we've come up short. But today, I'm inviting you to consider giving Jesus an opportunity. Today, I'm telling you to consider to allow Jesus to step into your boat. Watch what is happening here, because nighttime was the best time for fishing. The fish were nearer to the surface during the cool hours of the night and they were more easily located and taught and these men have worked so hard watch the word toil in and of itself means to labor with a wearisome effort and all night long these men have toiled to labor with this wearisome effort on their life and they pulled in their nets over and over again and they took nothing. That word translated, if we go back to the transliteral on it, if we bring it in and translate it today, means not even one. Not even behind the fisherman's seat, not behind the motor, not in the cooler, not we didn't find a fish. We got nothing. All night long they fished and haven't even caught a single sardine. All they wanted to do was go home and get some sleep and forgot about this awful night that they've had. And Simon talks to Jesus saying that, Lord, we've tried that. It didn't work. Lord, we've tried that and it fell. No offense, Jesus. We know what we're doing. We know how to do church. Leave the fishing to us. Leave this to us. We've tried. There's no use in doing it again. But he says, nevertheless, I'm going to let down our nets. And this is what happens when we allow Jesus Christ to step in. 
You see, the victory was already in Jesus because we never fight for victory, but always from victory. And right. when Jesus stepped into that boat, he stepped in, creating it from a place of toil into a place of intimacy. From a place of intimacy, a place that he could share and preach the word and victory begin to flow forth. I want you to know today that just as Jesus stepped into a boat of fishermen, Jesus will step into the boat or vessel of your life and he will turn that situation around. There was a miracle involving the fish. When Peter and the other men obeyed Jesus, they enclosed so many fish. Watch this that the word of God says that their nets threatened to break. They called for their partners and so many fish were loaded into those boats. The boats began to sink. Watch this church. They were fishing in the wrong place at the wrong time of day and still experienced the greatest success because they were experienced through Jesus Christ. Romans 8.37, I am more than a conqueror and who somebody in Christ Jesus and when he stepped up and he stepped into that boat he told those disciples well they're not disciples yet they're still fishermen but they'll be fisher up he told them to go to the wrong place in the wrong time of the day go there go there. I know you've toiled go back and do it again it's not going to look like what you thought it was going to look like it's not going to sound like what you thought it was going to look like the timing may not even be the timing that you thought it was going to be but God says when I show up, my clock is always dialed in. I know you think you're in the wrong place, but I'm about to show you where the right place is in me because you are a conqueror through me. And if we want to see the Lord do the same thing in us, it's going to take unity throughout the church. It's going to take us wanting to see the God of, of the heavens and the earth grant us a miracle so large that our boats are overflowing that we must learn to let down our nets when and where Jesus says to let them right. down. Yes, if it's right. at Kroger over the bread. Yes, if you're trying to get deli. Yes, if your boss is slaying you all the day long and God says speak a word to them. Remind them that they are called into justification right. that they're called a daughter or a son and I died for them just like I died for you little attitude as well. Come on somebody. Come on somebody. This means that we begin to allow Jesus to step in and he will begin to provide on us when we allow him a miracle that will involve the fish. Come on and he will use a miracle to involve the fishermen as well. When Simon and the others saw what Jesus had done these rough crew fishermen fell at the feet of Jesus and they humbly worship. Watch this. This the grace of man that threw sarcasm at the feet of Jesus as now just a few verses later, seeing what Jesus has done, seeing the miracle, the way maker, come on somebody, the wonderful counselor, come on somebody, seeing who is in front of him, and instantaneously, from a crude fisherman, from a rude mouth, come on somebody, he's dropped down and putting the praise of the Father on his lips, there's a miracle following after you, if you allow Jesus Christ to step in your boats, and come on, I want to let you know today that there's a miracle involving your future, you can come. Jesus said, Simon, watch this. They obeyed Jesus. They caught down for a catch more than they had ever seen. And after this happens, this is the greatest catch in this fisherman's whole life. And it's been brought in by not another fisherman, but by a prophet. <laughs> Come on, somebody. By a teacher of the word, by the Messiah. And Jesus says to them after they see this, he says, Simon, men, you haven't seen anything yet. You think that was something? Just wait until you see the souls getting caught in the gospel net. The Bible tells us that, the, hey, do me a favor. Run in the back. I, did not, is, I don't care for a Go in the back and give me a net real quick. It's in the, I got one back there, I promise. I know some of y'all are thinking, why well, do I have a net in my office? But I don't. <laughs> and it has nothing to do with this sermon, as a matter of fact. Just hook a left. It's over my mind. <laughs> I just need a minute. Hook a left. We can't edit this, this is live. <laughs> I'm gonna be in a lot of trouble later, yeah. Pray for you, Pastor. <laughs> but I mean, think about it. This is Simon Peter, his life has been involved. 
involved. It's been etched around this net, around what this net means, around what this net can bring into his life. Everything that Simon can do for himself is right here. It's right here. He can bring in, he can provide for his family through this net. This is what he was working with. Or, well, actually, they were working with a much larger net that you would kind of throw. But it's 2021. We're not going to use that net. <laughs> anyway, just to get the, the idea, even if he was using a regular net that first class fishermen would have used, then it would probably have been only 8 to 12 foot wide by another 8 to 12 foot wide. That was Peter's life, or as they call him here in this moment, that was Simon's life. He, and Jesus comes to this moment and says, you know what, Simon, I know that you're used to providing with this. And I know that you're used to thinking that when you can fill this thing up several times, when you can bring in a boat that you consider full, then you're going to do something. But you haven't seen anything yet. Just wait until you see souls getting captured in the gospel net. Just wait until you see people coming into my net. And no longer do you have to go into that that low, shallow place, but I'll step into it. All you've got to do is cast out that net and share my message and there will be a gospel involving your future, a miracle involving your future. Peter bowed at the feet of Jesus there on that ship, but later he would stand at Jerusalem, y'all, with that same kind of concept that Jesus was talking. Remember in that boat, he was a fisherman and everything that he did was etched out of what he could catch in that net, but Jesus says, I will make you a fisher of men casting off that old net from his life and giving him a bigger net through the power of the Holy Spirit to declare the gospel and watch Peter's first sermon. I'm salty. I had 15 pages. I lasted 12 minutes and 34 seconds on my first sermon. 15 pages, y'all. I was reading that. Like, now, some of y'all wish I would stick to my script now. No. I had like two pages to start today. <laughs> Big change, right? He, he says everything shifts. No longer do you have to provide from what you can do. But I'm showing you a future that will provide from the very essence of who I am. Y'all ever heard that scripture that says something like this? When God's in our life, he does exceedingly. Come on, I wish somebody would begin to shout at him. He does abundantly. Come on, somebody. Is there anybody in the house that feels the war? He does what? Exceedingly and abundantly. Come on, there's somebody that's going to preach to me. Come on. And that's what God wants to do in our life. He wants to take that old person who was there on that boat, who was dependent on what they did and what they knew how to do, and he wants to shift that and give you the same fire that he gave to Peter on that day of Pentecost. The man who had a good shaped mouth prior now walks in with the Holy Ghost shaped mouth and is a fisher of men and cast out his debt for a salvation hall that will pull in 3,000. I remember in my word that the Bible says that Jesus calls each one of us to do greater works than even this. Come on, somebody give praise in this house. Stand all over this house with me if you're able. Okay, you can bring down the first light and the second light. Come on, there's some people in this house today. You know what you need prayer for. You already need it. Come on, I want us to be. You know what I want us to do? There are some people in here that some, some of y'all just got to get some bother with yourself this morning. There are some of you in here that need to say, you know what, Jesus? I'm holding on to this thing right here. And Lord, today I need to let it go and step into your boat. Step back into my boat that you've got in, rather. Matter of fact, Jesus is already in your boat, somebody. He's waiting for you to get back in there. Anybody ever dealt with that? Somebody ever preached to somebody real quick. Oh, somebody over here playing with their net just a little bit too long. Jesus sitting over in your boat waiting on you. Yeah. All right. Some of y'all going to come through and do this then. Come on. I want us to so right now just begin to allow the Lord God to do it. Somebody, you, you need to walk up and you need to grab a hold of this mic. Shay's going to be right here. She's going to pray behind you. She's going to help you take that net, that next step into that net life. Come on, somebody. And begin to move it. Shay, you can come on and move forward because there's going to be some people moving through. Miss Sue's going to be over here. Right now, I want some people in this house. Maybe this net isn't about you. And you're like, you know what? I'm not trying to control it. I don't need to move it. I just need prayer because, man, every time God asks me to do something, I got this going. Am I can the live see me? I got this going every time God asks me to do something. I'm trying to ask the Lord for something new. I still ain't even begging on the old thing. Come on, somebody. Come on. We in where we are, where we are going, God is calling us into this place of intimacy with him. God wants you to know, and one of the reasons I feel like God wanted me to preach on this today from this place is because he sees and he's showing us the, the how something 
Simon has dealt, Simon's messed up at this point in life, right? He, I mean, at least through his night, at least through his words with Jesus, we can all agree that Simon is not a saint. He's not Saint Peter right here. He's Simon. He's you and I. He's hurt. He's had turmoil. He's been in that boat all night long. And here comes Jesus. And I just kind of wonder if Simon actually gets a little beside himself. He said, like, Jesus, man, I've been here. I've been putting in prayer. I've been reading this word. I've been listening to devotions. I listen to every one of Pastor Mike's sermons. I listen to Pastor Kevin's sermons. Hi, my name's Sarah, and I'm the youth leader for Rhythm Generation. And I want to invite you to come join us for the sound. Now you're here. Come on, make a sign. Come on, Pastor. Come on, Pastor. I don't know why Jesus causes us to wait sometimes. In John 9, verse 1, he comes upon a man, and the disciples ask him, Who has sinned? Is it this man or his parents? And he says, Neither has sinned. This is how it is, so that Jesus Christ may be glorified. Come on, somebody. There's another scenario in the scriptures, and I talked about it last week, where with Mary and Martha, they send word for their brother, but Jesus doesn't show up for three days, you guys. Three days. That means that they turn, toil and turmoil. Turl and toil. Now, I'm not going to say those two together. Turmoil is happening in the life. Hurt. They've lost somebody. Pain. Hi, my name is Sarah, and I'm the leader for the And I want to invite you to come join us this what summer. We're going to have a Jesus. jam-packed summer with a lot of really Same cool Same thing Simon said. Hey, Jesus, if you'd have been here. Same thing Simon said. Hey, Jesus, if you'd have been here. I love how Jesus in both situations almost is just, he's so calm. He tells them there that he's the resurrection and the life, and he raises Lazarus from the dead to show this miracle and to show how he works. And God wants to do the same thing in your life. You've never gone too far that God can't reach you. You've never strayed that God can't find you back to the way. Come on, somebody. I need you to know that today you are created.